Is death, truly the end? Could a part of our individuality continue to exist, in a dreamlike, alternate dimension of reality? Is this idea only wishful thinking, on the part of believers, or the result of certain unexplained experiences? These questions have intrigued mankind's most eminent thinkers and researchers for millennia, and are part of an ongoing scientific and philosophical debate called the survival of consciousness. In this episode of Do You Mind, we shall have a closer look at the phenomenon of terminal lucidity, where individuals, with severe brain damage, inexplicably regain awareness and cognition, shortly before their passing, as well as the vastly documented phenomenon, of near-death experiences, highly suggesting that the mind may, in fact, survive bodily death, when patients actually die, but do, come back to tell. Terminal lucidity is the unexpected return of cognition and memory, shortly before death, a rare condition, observed in patients diagnosed with a form of dementia and other illnesses. It was first observed in ancient times by Hippocrates and others, and widely acknowledged by physicians in the 19th century. French physician and psychiatrist Briere de Boismont stated that, in certain diseases, at the approach of death, we observe that the senses acquire a wonderful degree of susceptibility. The patients astonish those who are around them, by the elevation of their thoughts and the intellect, which may have been obscured, or extinguished during many years, is again restored in all its integrity. Seemingly due to brain damage that is considered irreversible, these patients normally have little recollection of past events, and are often unable to recognize close relatives. After long periods being either erratic, unresponsive or unconscious, some patients suddenly regain mental clarity, communicate coherently, and remember long forgotten periods of their lives. Sometimes, the dying are fully aware of their imminent passing, and may request the presence of loved ones, to say goodbye, often in a state of peace, and radiance, that strikingly contrasts with their behavior, prior to the lucid episode. It is believed that the use of pharmacology, may mask or deprive patients of the occurrence of terminal lucidity, which would explain its rarity in modern times. A recent systematic case review by Bacciani and Grayson, reported 124 cases of patients who experienced a lucid episode. They state, in more than 80% of these cases, complete remission, with return of memory, orientation, and responsive verbal ability was reported by observers of the lucid episode. The majority of patients died within hours to days after the episode. Biologist Michael Numb, who has spent the last decade researching terminal lucidity, states, the most remarkable cases involve patients whose brains were destroyed, by diseases such as tumors and Alzheimer's disease, but who seemed to recover shortly before death, with their memory being intact. Citing a case reported in 2007, Chiriboga Oliskrek states, one of the most interesting eyewitness accounts was presented by Dr. Haig. He describes a case of a patient suffering from lung cancer with brain metastasis. According to Haig, after performing the last scan of the patient's head, the physician stated that there was scarcely any brain tissue left that was not attacked by cancer. The patient did not react to external and internal stimuli, and to Haig, he looked as if he was absent. According to the nurse and the family present at his bed, David woke up for five minutes during which he conversed and patted everyone, after which he went back into this state of non-existence, in order to die one hour later. A hypothesis by Bostancicliaglu, suggests that dementia would have much to do with memory retrieval, 
and that the sudden reinstatement of mental faculties, would be caused by the fluctuation of neuromodulators, projecting from the brainstem, to the medial prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. Given the difficulty of monitoring such unpredictable events, in both animal, and human subjects, this hypothesis remains an apparently valid description of the biochemical processes of terminal lucidity, without, however, addressing its underlying causation mechanism. Recent cases witnessed and reported by doctors, nurses and relatives, also contradict the common assumption, that mental processes, arise from brain activity. Admittedly, how can mental faculties and memories resurface, if the areas of the brain allegedly responsible for memory, language skills, and cognition, have been obliterated beyond recovery? What underlying mechanism could cause such an abrupt, yet short-lived access to memories, cognition and verbal communication? Do we not see here a similarity, with phenomena observed in dissociative identity disorder, as mentioned in the previous episode, where the mind demonstrates a near total ascendancy over the brain. Could such ascendancy be absolute to the point of allowing the mind to temporarily manifest, regardless of brain deterioration? Curiously enough, there is very little interest in this condition within the scientific milieu, when it may, in fact, be of paramount importance, not only in regards to the nature of the mind, but to our understanding of the etiology or causation for a variety of mental illnesses. Such a sudden and misunderstood reinstatement of mental faculties poses a serious challenge, to the irreversibility paradigm of chronic, degenerative conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, and also to the general assumption that the causes of such diseases, are predominantly neurophysiological. In summary, terminal lucidity constitutes yet another piece of evidence, against a purely neurological causation for the mind, an interpretation that once propelled the advances of neuroscience, but has now become an impediment, to the sciences of the mind. This puzzling phenomenon logically brings us to another death-related experience, which is comparatively far more common, extensively documented and studied. Near-death experiences, or NDEs, encompass a variety of mental phenomena, which sometimes occur while an individual is clinically dead, when any measurable activity in the heart or brain has ceased, until vitality is restored, either spontaneously, or through life-saving techniques such as cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Although the term near-death experience was popularized by American psychiatrist Raymond Moody, in his book Life After Life, the earliest known accounts of such experiences emerge in ancient Greece, at the close of Plato's Republic, written around 380 BCE. Myth of Ur, describes the post-mortem experiences of Ur, a warrior who was reportedly dead for 12 days, before returning to life, and telling others about what he had seen in the afterlife. We shall briefly review some of its content, due to its resemblance to what is commonly reported in modern times. In Myth of Ur, we read. He said that when his soul left the body, he went on a journey with a great company, and that they came to a mysterious place. A benevolent guiding figure is a recurring theme in NDE reports, which shall be interpreted as an angel, or prophet by religious individuals, or as beings of light, by the non-religious. Another recurring theme is a bright light, or passing through a tunnel of light. In Ur, we read, They could see from above a line of light, straight as a column, extending right through the whole heaven and through the earth, in color resembling the rainbow, only brighter and purer. Although most NDEs include a form of relief from physical pain, and a sensation of peace, about 15% of them are notably negative. According to Bush and Grayson, distressing NDEs occur under the same wide range of circumstances and feature most of the same elements as pleasant NDEs. What differs is the emotional tone, 
which ranges from fear, through terror, to, in some cases, guilt or despair. Some individuals report the sensation of falling into a void, to dark regions, seemingly within the earth itself. In the mysterious place reported in Myth of Ur, a flux of incoming and outgoing souls move towards upper worlds, on the right, or to underworlds on the left, seemingly according to their prior behavior. Those returning from below, weeping and sorrowing at the remembrance of the things which they had endured and seen, in their journey beneath the earth, while those from above were describing heavenly delights and visions of inconceivable beauty. Another recurring theme is being told to return, either because the individuals are not ready, or because they should tell others about what they had witnessed. Once again, in Ur. They told him that he was to be the messenger, who would carry the report of the other world to men. More recent scriptures in the New Testament, from 367 AD, the Quran, 632 AD, and the Tibetan Book of the Dead, 1386 AD, also relate near-death experiences. In present-day research, the fact that recurring themes in NDEs are relatively consistent, and sometimes interpreted according to the individual's beliefs, has led many researchers to attribute them to culturally determined hallucinations. Yet, such a hasty, and convenient conclusion is easily refuted, by the numerous cases of NDEs occurring in young children, who consistently report similar themes, often long before they can develop or assimilate notions, let alone beliefs, in an afterlife. According to Raymond Moody, the occurrence of NDEs does not seem related to patients' prior religious training or beliefs. In other words, such reports are neither different, nor more frequent in populations with widespread beliefs in an afterlife, a view that is increasingly corroborated by newer studies, such as the one by Hoshab et al. on an Iranian Muslim population sample. Additionally, it is not uncommon for ND patients to report out-of-body experiences, where they see their own bodies and surroundings, from a third-person, and often top-down perspective. According to Jeffrey Long, the high percentage of accurate out-of-body observations, during near-death experiences, does not seem explainable by any possible physical brain function, as it is currently known. These include accurate observations while patients experiencing OBs are verifiably comatose, and observations of events occurring far from their physical body, beyond any possible physical sensory awareness. A famous case is Pam Reynolds, who underwent a complex surgical procedure, to have an aneurysm in her brain removed, where all blood must be drained, all organ activity stopped, and body temperature lowered to 60 degrees. Under full anesthesia, she unbelievably witnessed the entire surgery, from above the doctor's shoulder, was later able to precisely describe the instruments used, and report comments made by the nurses during the surgery. If such an accurate visual and auditory confirmation was not puzzling enough, other case studies are even more mind-boggling, and yet remain conveniently ignored, given the cataclysmic consequences for many fields of science, if these findings were ever confirmed experimentally. During a near-death experience, some individuals who are blind from birth, not only experienced the same elements as sighted persons, but they could actually see, and accurately describe elements of their environment. With the prudence and skepticism required from researchers, in the face of such an extraordinary claim, Ring and Cooper sought to further investigate, and went on to locate and interview blind persons, including those blind from birth, who believed they had undergone either an NDE, or an OBE, not related to any near-death incident. We were concerned to determine whether in fact, 
Any reliable evidence could be deduced from such a sample, that the blind really do see, under such conditions. Through 11 national, regional, and state organizations for the blind in the U.S., a total of 31 respondents qualifying for the inclusion were contacted and interviewed, being 21 who had had a near-death experience, and 10 who had had one or more out-of-body experiences. The collected reports tend to be indistinguishable from those of sighted persons, with respect to the elements that serve to define the classic NDE pattern, such as the feelings of great peace and well-being that attend the experience, the sense of separation from the physical body, the experience of traveling through a tunnel or dark space, the encounter with the light, the life review, and so forth. Such findings revealed that blind persons, including those blind from birth, do report classic NDEs of the kind common to sighted persons, that the great preponderance of blind persons claim to see during NDEs and OBEs, and that occasionally, claims of visually based knowledge that could not have been obtained by normal means can be independently corroborated. A leading figure in transpersonal psychology, psychiatrist Stanislav Grof stated, occurrences of this kind, unlike most of the other aspects of near-death phenomena, can be subjected to objective verification. They thus represent the most convincing proof, that what happens in near-death experiences, is more than the hallucinatory phantasmagoria, of physiologically impaired brains. Understandably, near-death experiences present a problem of colossal proportions, for the proponents of the physicalist interpretation of the mind as a product of the brain. For obvious reasons, such clinical data is kept at arm's length, or discredited, for allegedly producing weak, anecdotal evidence. Fortunately for some patients, brain monitoring and imaging technologies can provide strong evidence, to support their first-hand testimonies in the face of skepticism, by demonstrating the absence of neurological activity during an NDE, not only in the visual cortex, but in several areas of the brain seemingly mandatory for the manipulation of mental imagery. Such a correlation was demonstrated in a study by Schlegel et al., using functional magnetic resonance imaging, the same study mentioned in the second episode of Do You Mind, which corroborates Wilder Penfield's insights on higher-level mental processes, being somehow independent from brain circuitry. Hypotheses presented to explain the cognition reported by patients during an NDE, often rely on some form of residual brain activity, which would operate below the detection threshold of current day monitoring equipment. Although seemingly compelling, this hypothesis faces a major theoretical problem. If the mind is a product of the brain, then, residual brain activity should logically lead to residual mental activity, cognition, perception, or awareness. What some near-death experiences report, however, is precisely the opposite, a fully-fledged, if not enhanced form of awareness and perception. For the Italian researchers Facco and Argrillo, complete brain anoxia, with absent electrical activity in cardiac arrest, is incompatible with any form of consciousness, according to present scientific knowledge, making the finding of an explanation for NDEs a challenging task, for the ruling physicalist, and reductionist view of biomedicine. To use an imperfect, yet practical analogy, let's imagine supplying a computer, with only 3% of the power it normally requires to function. What is likely to happen, if we turn it on? If we are lucky, it may load a peripheral configuration page. Would it be logical to expect such residual activity, to allow the loading, of not only an operational system, but of the latest 3D game, with entire worlds, sounds, and even mystical characters interacting with the user? 
we must convene that this scenario is very unlikely, if not practically impossible. Thus, residual brain activity implies residual mental activity, unless, of course, the mind is not a product of the brain. Ring and Cooper, who studied NDs in the blind, concluded that empirical support for sight in the blind would be consistent with various new paradigm visions of science that are rooted in non-local, non-dual or holonomic perspectives, in which consciousness is the primary reality. Much to the dismay of orthodox materialists, some daring new hypotheses on non-local or quantum-like consciousness are indeed picking up speed, and most importantly, they seem to be theoretically more capable than the mainstream interpretation in explaining a wide variety of uncommon mental and psychophysiological phenomena. Such is the case for James Lake's hypothesis, in the near-death experience, implications for neuroscience and non-local consciousness, where he states, the rich phenomenology associated with NDEs and other kinds of transpersonal experiences suggests that an adequate explanatory model of consciousness will include both established neurophysiological mechanisms and quantum-like or other postulated non-classical processes. I propose that the dynamic interconnectivity between networks is in a state of continuous flux in response to modulatory inputs at a classical or neurophysiological and non-classical quantum level, resulting in multiple overlapping, deterministic, and stochastic patterns of brain activity, on multiple temporal and spatial scales. And to the skeptics, who would dogmatically dismiss, such a far-fetched, blasphemous distortion of quantum theories, we shall remind that all natural phenomena, are essentially, quantum. Aside from the theoretical problems related to NDEs, and their often life-changing quality for patients, their aftermath can also pose a major challenge to physicians, because the spiritual and otherworldly connotations of their patients' reports hardly ever fit the concepts and jargon of clinical practice. Such an extraordinary experience, being reduced to mere hallucinations or residual brain activity, may cause religious individuals to feel entirely misunderstood, while atheists may find it difficult to dismiss such experience as hallucinatory, but will do so, because their beliefs do not allow for an alternative explanation. According to Bush and Grayson, the primary effect of many NDEs is a powerful and enduring awareness that the physical world is not the full extent of reality. Because this perception runs so deeply counter to Western materialism, and conversely, because its implications affect some dogmatic, theological teachings, the new conviction commonly overturns experiences personal life and social relationships abruptly and permanently. For physicians, non-judgmental listening may be the most workable alternative. In other words, potentially relevant data on the mind is conveniently dismissed, not because it has been shown to be false, but because it goes against the dominant, materialistic, and reductionist worldview that pervades the scientific milieu, a belief that has been fiercely defended for centuries, in a paradoxical attempt, at freeing humanity, from belief systems. On the problem of the survival of consciousness to bodily death, a topic which directly involves all human beings, perhaps, the scientific community could afford, to be a little less dogmatic, and a little bit more scientific. In the next episode, we will analyze evidence suggesting that the mind, may not only survive bodily death, but also pre-exist the molecular, and cellular organization of the body, if not its very conception. All this, and much more, on Do You Mind? <laughs>